Why are you so attentive this morning? You look so cute. You're such a good girl. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. As you know, we did a Q&A last week, so it's been two weeks since we actually reviewed the data. Not a lot has actually changed in those two weeks. Uh, if you look at emergency room visits for upper respiratory infections, it's been flat. Most of them are due to uh, SARS or COVID-19, not the flu and RSV yet. The good news is hospitalizations are continuing to fall. As you can see, they're beginning to plateau. Mostly it's in the 70 plus years of age that are be being hospitalized. But I remind people, if you look at cumulative mortality, we're almost at 1.2 million deaths from uh, COVID-19. So things are looking good, but it, it was a pretty devastating few years. Uh, uh, wastewater data is pretty stable. It's slightly up. If you look at the sites that are reporting over uh, 100 to 200 percent increases, 49 percent of the sites are, are reporting that versus 38 percent two weeks ago. And if you look at the BioBot analysis, uh, it's about the same, pretty flat. Here in Houston, we were doing great, but most of the sites are reporting down, but one site uh, in Katy reported a 617% increase. So I wouldn't go to Katy right now. I'm not sure what is going on out there, but there, there's probably gonna be an outbreak uh, in Katy. Uh, if you look at what's driving it, the variants are pretty much the same, four major ones, although HV1 now is the dominant variant. It moved ahead of EG5. But as it's, most of those four variants uh, are, account for almost 95, 98% of uh, what's driving the, uh, the, the, the continuing replication in the United States. I want to give you some information about uh, TEFI, which is the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute that, uh, that was started uh, by the governor and led by Eric Borwinkle. It's really kind of interesting. We in Texas, not necessarily the most progressive state, are doing something really interesting, which is we're trying to get over 90% of the population uh, wastewater covered by, uh, by uh, sequencing data. And so uh, this is a program that is, is being led by the Texas uh, and Public Health School here in the University of uh, Texas, but the science is mostly done by us and Dr. Moreso's group. And Dr. Maressa just published in Nature Communication the first comprehensive total virome surveillance from wastewater across Texas. And what he did was look at 300, uh, he looked at 10 distinct sites in two major cities, Houston and El Paso, looked at 363 samples. And what's amazing was able to sequence 450 distinct pathogenic viruses that are, are in wastewater, including SARS-CoV-2, influenza, monkeypox, norovirus. So, it just has huge implications for our ability to monitor because we're not very good at identifying case, cases. And, and actually, this I think is gonna transform the way we do viral surveillance in the United States. And if you say well, it was one good thing that came out of COVID pandemic, I'd say that was it. Uh, the other interesting thing, there's a really uh, interesting paper that was published in Cell uh, this past week and basically looked at the evolution of, of the virus. And, you know, there's sort of two major ways of evolution that the virus has had uh, over this last several years. The first is what they call intrinsic uh, uh, evolution, which is basically characteristics of the virus. So it either binds more tightly or it replicates faster or it gets into cells more. And during the early part of the pandemic, that was really the major driving force, these intrinsic uh, uh, adaptations. But there's one uh, major one now the, that they call extrinsic, and that is avoidance of the immune response. So if you look at this really interesting phases, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, it was just really people being infected what was driving, uh, driving the evolution. But then when, the vi when uh, vaccines came on board, it changed the way the evolution happened. So this was the period during uh, which the original strain was around and the alpha strain, delta strain, and then the major change was Omicron. So what they point out is that when the bivalent vaccine became, avail uh, became available, uh, it really forced the evolution of the virus into this more uh, avoidance of the immune response into an antigenic uh, change. And so that's very, 
It's interesting because what they point out is you have to understand you can predict what the antigenic changes will be. And for us to really be done with this virus, just the way we're doing it with just the most recent strain of the, of the, to the spike protein is not going to do it. We need a pan-coronavirus vaccine or ones that have what's to the current strains but also anticipate future developments. So there's enough science now to be able to do that. And in order for us really to be rid of it, I think that's what's going to take. Otherwise, we're going to just have every year a different one based on the current uh, strains. Now, the one thing that's really concerning was the BA 2.86 mutation, which was a lot like uh, Omicron. It, was, it had you know, a bunch of mutations, 40 different mutations, many in the spike protein. And it was sort of between the BA2 strain and XBB. And one of these strains, JN.1, actually has a tight, more tightly bound to the receptor. The interesting thing is while this was a big concern, it has not really dominated. So while it's around and it's in, in many countries and in the United States, in Texas, it hasn't outcompeted the current strains. And there was one other paper that was published in Nature Communication that basically took that spike protein, BA2.86, and showed that there was no growth advantage. So we have some evidence that even though it's a scary kind of mut mutations that have happened, it's not, uh, it's not it's out competing the current strains. Uh, there was also a, comp a comment by Eric Topol this past week, just pointing out that the evolution of this virus is really quite different from many of the other viruses and that, that the um, SARS-CoV-2 has a two and a half fold more uh, rapid substitutions and in, 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 in mutations than influenza uh, and that the, uh, the antigen evolution has been sevenfold faster than other coronaviruses, just pointing out the real concern that this particular coronavirus is going to constantly be mutating. And then there's one other interesting thing. You know, it's very hard now for us to really follow what's going on. So the, the uh, U.S. has developed uh, a screen, a CDC traveler-based genomic surveillance uh, program called TGS, and at most of the major entries, airports, they're either doing nasal swabs, uh, which are probably not very effective, but uh, the ones that are checking wastewater like they do at JFK is actually probably the best thing. And, and that's what we're going to have to do nationally, have a surveillance for probably wastewater from airplanes as the best way to do it. And then finally, I just want to end with, uh, there was a, a, a stem cell report uh, paper that was showing that a bunch of businesses now are, are purporting to be able to have cures for coronaviruses through stem cell interventions and exosomal products. And there's no evidence to support it. And so there's an alert. And these are very expensive. And there's, there's a bunch of sites that are in the United States, over, over 60 clinics now in the U.S. and Mexico that are purporting to have immune boosters using stem cells and other things. And there's no evidence to do it. So if you see those things, please don't start going to them without talking to me first. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs. First of all, first of all uh, this Saturday is the Houston Walk to End Alzheimer's. It's organized by the Alzheimer's Association. And I, would thank, I want to thank Dr. Mark Kunick, who's the chair of the Houston Walk. Uh, he's a psychiatrist on our faculty and specializes in caring for geriatric patients, particularly those with uh, memory disorders. Also, a, a shout-out to uh, Lisa Folador, who serves on the board of the Alzheimer's Association and is an administrator in our Center for Molecular and Human Genetics. Uh, and all the other people who've been involved with um, raising funds for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's research. Also, the Analytic Scientist Power List announced the 100 most influential people in analytic science, and Dr. Livia Eberlin, an associate professor in surgery, was recognized as uh, one of the top 25 inventors in trailblazers, and that's because she's developed a mass spec device. It's like a pen that can sample uh, for cancer tissues in real time. It's really very cool. Uh, very intricate, really exciting uh, science. Uh, and then, of course, the Lifetime Achievement Award to Sheldon Kaplan, faculty member in pediatrics who received the American Academy of Pediatrics in Infectious Disease Award for lifetime contributions. Anyway, hope you have a wonderful weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.